Something we talked about in the last video is reliability, which is how consistent a measure is in assessing a latent variable. So let me give you an example of what we mean by that. Let's say we're measuring someone's intelligence on an IQ test. In most IQ tests, the average intelligence score is 100, and then anything above that indicates high intelligence, anything below that means lower intelligence. And let's say we're testing someone who has an IQ that actually is 100. So let's say we have that person come in and take a test, and on their first test, they get a score that's kind of low. Let's say it's a 93. To some extent, this might reflect somewhat of a true score because it's around 100, but maybe when they came in, they didn't do so well on some of the questions because maybe the scale was culturally biased, or maybe they were just a little tired that day. So let's say you have them come in a week later, take another intelligence test, and this time they get something quite a bit higher, maybe around 104. So let's say you have them do this over and over and over again, the next day and the next day and the next day, if you notice that they get a lot of scores that are very different from each other, so let's say we have them take it a bunch of times and their scores sort of form a distribution that looks like this, you might say that that's not a very reliable scale. Even though on average, it is getting their IQ of around 100, sometimes when they get tested, they have an IQ as high as 120, maybe even as low as 80. So in other words, the scores are just all over the place. There's no consistency there. So that would be a scale with low reliability. Now let's say we had a more reliable scale that we could test them with, something that yielded more consistent scores. Let's take a look at what that might look like. In this case, let's say again, they're taking the intelligence test multiple times, and their true score or actual IQ is right around 100. If the test is more consistent, then you should expect that the first time they take the test, it should be pretty close to 100, maybe around a 97. And the second time they take the test, it should still be pretty close to 100, maybe 103. So you notice you might still not get exactly 100 because there are lots of different factors besides someone's IQ that will determine how well they do in an IQ test. Again, are they coming in maybe fatigued or maybe they just took some caffeine and might overperform on the test. But with a good test, you should see them sort of bouncing around their true score and sometimes landing right on it. And so let's again say this person takes the test a bunch of times. This time it's yielding a more consistent result. You're getting right around 100 a lot more of the time, and you're never getting something like 120 or 80. So again, if we were to look at the distribution of these, you notice a much more consistent pattern. A lot more of the time, they're hitting right around their true score of 100. Now, in reality, we never know someone's true score. We don't know what their actual IQ is, but if you have a reliable scale and you have them take it a few times, it's really easy to tell because that's where they should be hitting the most. This is sort of what we call someone's signal and the variance around it would be someone's noise or something that detracts from the signal. So this is something we're often looking at with tests is if someone takes a test over and over again, is the signal really clear or is there a lot of noise in the data? Are they getting the same type of score consistently on that test or are they getting scores that kind of bounce all over the place? So in this case, a scale that yields this type of distribution from multiple testings is clearly more reliable. It's hitting right around 100 most of the time. So like I was saying, whenever you're testing someone, what you're really interested in is their true score. What would their score be if you were in a perfect world where you could perfectly measure that variable? And it could be intelligence, it could be extroversion, prejudice, anything you're trying to measure. But the thing we're always dealing with in the real world is called measurement error or random variance. Sometimes people call this the noise around the signal. And the noise is often determined by random factors, such as how someone's feeling that day, Maybe they're distracted or bored, or maybe they're just really on task and performing better than they usually do. But what we want to do as psychologists is to minimize this noise as much as possible so that most of the time when someone takes a test, we're getting something that's right around their true score. So one way to do that is to minimize error due to bad survey design. This was covered in our survey methods lecture. But you want to make sure that, for instance, you're not using items that are overly complex, double-barreled, or not using reverse scored items so that someone might show a positivity bias. That's just including more noise in our sample. You also want to make sure that you're measuring the same thing every time. So for example, if you're trying to measure depression, you might want to measure things that are relatively stable in people who are depressed, such as their eating and sleeping habits, and avoid measuring things that tend to change all the time for everyone, such as someone's current emotional mood. For example, everyone can have a bad day, but only in people who are depressed does it consistently affect their eating and sleeping patterns. And of course, one important thing too is that you're measuring only the desired variable, 
So let's say you have a measure of depression that's actually measuring other stuff too, such as social anxiety or anxiety in general. In this case, you're gonna again introduce more noise because what you really wanna do is just measure that depression. So you always wanna just concentrate on the latent variable and only measure that. So there are several methods for measuring reliability to measure how consistent a given measure is. And one of them that we've been talking about already, it's just called test retest reliability. This is when you have someone take the same scale multiple times and see if basically they get the same score. Now, usually you don't wanna give someone the same survey 75 or 100 times, so you might just give it to them twice. But you do this with a number of different participants to make sure that per participant, you're not getting a wide dispersion of scores, that most of the time participants are getting scores that are pretty consistent across testings. So in general, you wanna make sure that participants' first score is highly correlated with their second, third, fourth, or how many other times they get scored. And you also wanna make sure to space apart all the times that you measure them so that they don't get what's called practice effects. For example, if you're measuring IQ, sometimes simply taking the IQ test over and over again can help people get better at it because they get practice at it. So maybe you'd wanna space out testings a month apart so they don't get better at the test simply by taking it and retaking it. Now, one drawback to this method is that it takes a lot of time. You have to get participants into the lab and measure them multiple times, and often participants don't like taking the same measure over and over again. So another method of measuring reliability is to look at what's called internal consistency reliability. This is when you have multiple questions or behavioral assessments measuring the same thing, and you can make sure that these are highly correlated. So for example, instead of looking at two different testings of extroversion, let's say, you have participants take a 40 item measure once where all the items are measuring extroversion. And you would hope that across these 40 items, they're showing consistent scores. So that if their answer to one item indicates they're highly extroverted, you should expect the same kind of thing on another item measuring extroversion. One way to do this is to do what's called the split half method. This is where you basically take half the items on a scale and correlate them with the other half. So if it's a 40 point scale, you take the first 20 items and correlate them with the second set of 20 items. And you should expect if all the items are measuring the same thing, that these two halves should be highly correlated with each other. A good indication is a correlation of about 0.7 or higher. That indicates a strong positive correlation. There's also a statistical method you can use that does pretty much the same thing. It's called the Chromebox Alpha Test. What this does is it takes each item and correlates it with the sum of all the other items. So let's say you have a 40 item survey again. What it would do is see if the answer to the first item is correlated with the average of items two through 40. And then it would take item two and look to see if the answer to that item is correlated with all the other items. So it does this all electronically on computers, so it only takes a few microseconds. And then what it does is it calculates an average correlation for all the items. And once again, what you'd hope for is a correlation of about a 0.7 or above because that indicates all the items are positively correlated with each other, just like you'd expect if they're all measuring the same thing. The last method of measuring reliability is called inter-rater reliability. This is when you have multiple raters or experimenters measure the same thing and make sure that they're coming up with consistent results. This is especially common if you're doing things like coding observations. If you're recording people's naturalistic behavior, then often that coding is a bit subjective. Let's say, again, if you're trying to measure extroversion, how can you tell if someone is quote unquote talkative or shy? Often this comes down to a subjective interpretation. So hopefully what you've done as a researcher is create some kind of coding scheme or trained your experimenters in such a way so that the way they rate people is very reliable, very consistent. And of course the best way to test that is to have them rate the same person and see if all the experimenters are coming up with the same types of scores. So if one rater rates a person as being highly extroverted, you should expect all the other raters to do the same. So those are a few different methods to see how consistent and reliable your scale is.